All right, uh, it's time to start. Welcome to the second lecture uh, about the introduction to Lattice QCD. We have seen yesterday how to discretize the scalar field theory and how to write the Euclidean version of the scalar, uh, scalar field theory action. And um, what remains to discuss related to the discretization that of the continuum theory on the lattice that we've discussed yesterday is what is exactly the relation between our theory defined on a space-time lattice so relation between the theory defined on the lattice and previously studied continuum theory. So what Lattice does for us uh, here automatically is basically uh, regulating the existing uh, ultraviolet divergences in the theory. So uh, the fact that we have defined the minimum allowed distance between the two lattice, the, to, to between the two points where we defined our scalar fields, so the sides of the lattice, if you recall, uh, contain the dynamical field variables, and this minimal distance, which we said we will call lattice spacing, A, at the same time imposes the sharp, sharp cutoff on the uh, momenta which are allowed on the lattice. So this cutoff is proportional to the inverse of A. So basically this tells us that all the allowed momenta in our lattice formulation of scaled field theory are limited in what would be in um, analogous uh, theory in uh, so in the solid what you're you used to seeing in the solid state theory when studies lattices studying lattices as well uh, basically that all the momenta are limited to the so-called first Brillouin zone so this means that uh, lattice spacing times the lattice momenta has to satisf satisfy the following in inequality. So basically, a times p, uh, a times a times lattice momenta uh, has to be contained within the first brilliant zone on the lattice. So in order to obtain the continuum theory, which has the allowed momenta from <laughs> zero to infinity, we have to tune the bare parameters of our lattice theory. I'm going to write down the Euclidean uh, action for their scalar field theory once again uh, during the course of this lecture. But um, so if you recall, we had uh, the three parameters, the M0 and uh, the coupling. So we have to tune the bare parameters of the uh, lattice theory in such a way that after taking the continuum limit that uh, we recover the continuum physics below um, at some energy scales mu well bef below the cutoff imposed by our uh, lattice discretization so at some energy scales mu <laughs> where mu times a is much smaller than one and uh, what help us helps us do that uh, so perform this continuum limit is precisely the analogy uh, that we mentioned already earlier between the theory uh, uh, the, the scalar field theory defined in uh, Euclidean space-time and the the what we know already from statistical mechanics and this analogy between the statistical mechanics and quantum field theories was first uh, introduced in the uh, renormalization group formalism by Kenneth Wilson 
in the seminal work already in 1974, which goes under the name Confinement of Quarks. And I'm going to try to sketch uh, the basics of this uh, relationship between the renormalization of quantum field theory and the critical phenomena in statistical mechanics. So let's assume that M physical is some mass in our theory that stays finite. as we take the continuum limit of lattice spacing going to zero. So, as already mentioned yesterday, so we have to work with <coughs> dimension uh, less quantities. So if this is M physics, our physical mass, then A times M physics will be our dimensionless quantity. And since we know that the physical mass itself stays finite, this means that when we take the limit of A going to zero, so the continuum limit of this dimensional S quantity, then uh, this quantity will give us zero in the continuum limit. So now if you make analogy with statistical mechanics, so, in statistical mechanics, um, we know that the physical mass of the system is proportional to the inverse of the correlation length. So, this means that in the continuum limit, we expect, expect the following. So since physical mass, uh, let's say this factor of proportionality is one for simplicity. So if physical mass is equal to inverse of the correlation length, this means that A divided by correlation length from what we have had previously will go to zero. So uh, if we just uh, reverse this fraction, fraction, we will have that the limit of the correlation length divided by the lattice spacing as A goes to zero, so in the continuum limit, this ratio will uh, diverge. All right? And um, so this is the situation, again, well known from statistical physics. So basically, in statistical mechanics, we know that the critical points of the system are uh, defined as, as the points in the phase diagram where precisely the correlation length uh, diverges. So this tells us that, in a way, the continuum limit of a quantum field theory is related to the critical points of a uh, uh, studied lattice model. So continuum limit in a quantum field theory corresponds to the critical points of some lattice model. So this is the first conclusion we draw from statistical physics. And another important conclusion in order to understand better how this continuum limit is taken is the following. So Again, from statistical mechanics, we know that 
the long distance physics near criticality defined by the diverging correlation length is um, dictated only by the symmetries of the system and the dimensionality of the system, but not, um, it's not dictated by the precise details of the Hamiltonian. So, long distance physics <coughs> depends only on so not long distance physics but near these critical points so so once we are in this criticality region then uh, actual long distance physics that we're interested in depends only on the symmetries of the system and its dimensiona dimensionality. And uh, not by specific details of the Hamiltonian. So the details of the Hamiltonian are not important once uh, we are in this critical region. So basically, this gives us a, a very important property of the continuum limit of lattice gauge theories, which goes under the name of universality. And uh, this tells us that the details of the discretization on the lattice scale uh, do not uh, determine our low energy predictions. So the low energy predictions should be independent of the very details of the discretization at the lattice scale as long, th as, long as uh, these details uh, respect some basic uh, symmetries and have the same dimensionality as the theory that we uh, plan to study. So, uh, so this property inherited from uh, this analogy from statis with statistical mechanics actually tells us that we can, as we will see in the following lectures also, that we can discretize QCD action in various ways and still uh, obtain the same low energy uh, dynamics that we are interested in, as long as we respect the necessary, so the well-known symmetries of QCD. Uh, so there are different lattice discretizations. So the details of the lattice discretizations due to this property of universality near criticality, once we are taking continuum limit, the details will um, go away and we will recover the uh, the properties of the underlying theory, as long as we haven't violated the basic symmetries of QCD. And after finishing this discussion about the uh, uh, continuum limit, we are going to uh, discuss in more detail how lattice QCD simulations are in, in this class, in particular, how lattice simulations of scalar field theories are um, can be conducted with some modern algorithms which are currently also used for QCD simulations. And in this second part of the lectures, we are going to exploit even more. So in the numerical simulations approach, we are even more going to exploit the uh, analogy between the Euclidean quantum field theories and statistical mechanics. So with this, we officially start the second part of the lectures on numerical simulations and the example of scalar field theories.
So we have defined the Euclidean version of the scalar field theory action yesterday. I'm going to write down what we had previously. So it was one half covariant derivative that needs to be discretized plus one half m0 squared field squared and plus 1 over 4 factorial g0 and the quartic coupling term. All right. And so what we want to compute in this theory and also later in lattice QCD is some uh, expectation values of the observables. And we've written our uh, partition function yesterday. And knowing the partition function, we can compute the expectation value of an arbitrary observable O in the following way, by integrating over field configurations phi, then having our Euclidean action as a Boltzmann weight multiplied by the original observable O. So in order to estimate this observable, uh, so the expectation value of the observable numerically, one usually generates an ensemble of field configurations. And we're going to study today one of the algorithms to generate this ensemble of field configurations numerically. So if we generate the ensemble of field of some a certain number of field configurations, say starting from phi 1, phi 2, and our last configuration, let's numerate it as fn config. So this is the total number of the field configurations that we have generated in some way, such that so if we generate them in a special way, that they are actually distributed according to uh, the Bolt, this Boltzmann weight. So the distribution uh, defined by this particular Boltzmann weight. So So if you have the algorithm that generates the field configurations such that their distribution is defined by this Boltzmann weight in the part path integral, S E of F, then we can compute this simple this average simply by averaging over the so simply by evaluating our observable on each of these field configurations and um, averaging over the full ensemble of n configurations. So the estimator for the average of this observable O we will denote as O uh, with this overline and this will be, so if the configurations 
are already gener generated such that they are already distributed according to this Boltzmann weight, then an estimator for this observable would be computed just by averaging over n configurations of the observable all computed on each of these uh, previously genera generated field configurations. So the sum goes from one to total number of generated field configurations. So the estimator uh, of the expectation value of the observable is uh, given in this way. And of course, since this is just an estimator, we are making some error uh, in this uh, approximation. And this error, it turns out, if we generate the configurations which are distributed according to this Boltzmann uh, distribution, then that the error is naively, we will discuss in more detail what is a more precise estimate of the error. So um, the naive error estimate would be that the statistical error, the pure statistical error, will uh, be proportional to 1 over the square root of our total number of configurations. So if we generate uh, our ensemble of field configurations from phi 1 to phi n config, with this proper, uh, uh, with this proper probability distribution, then our naive statistical error will be proportional to the one over the square root of number of configurations. And the next question is how to generate the ensemble of field configurations, which satisfies our predefined probability distribution. So yes, please. Seems dominant to the leading term, no? So the correction is 1 over the square root, whereas the other term is 1 over n. Um, but then you still have the I measurement understand. of the observables as well, yeah. But uh, in principle, so compared to the numerical integration methods that Guy was mentioning, for example, yesterday. Um, so the Monte Carlo approach, which uh, has an error which is proportional, so 1 over uh, square root of n, would not be an optimal way to work in case you would have here only one or two field variables. But given that we need to compute this multi-dimensional integral, which has thousands or millions of integrations, so field variables that we need to integrate over, because be reminded that this is actually, uh, once we've discretized the theory, that this is the product over uh, the integrals over all field variables phi x. So basically, the number of integrals that we need to perform is uh, proportional to the number of lattice points. and. Uh, uh, so far, there is no better method than the Mon Monte Carlo in order to perform such a high dimensional uh, numerical integration. So it, it's a good point to notice that some other integration uh, methods have uh, a better factor here than square root of n. But for multi-dimensional integrals, this is still the best way to go. And actually, we will see towards the end of this lecture that this uh, 1 over square root of n is actually the best case of Monte Carlo errors. There is this error is actually uh, uh, additionally enlarged by the correlations between the field configurations that we are going to discuss very briefly today and in a bit more detail in the last lecture. So the way to generate uh, this ensemble of field configurations with the correct probability distribution uh, is to 
use the so-called Markov process procedure. So this is a recursive procedure uh, which generates uh, this ensemble of field configurations with a predefined probability distribution. In our case, uh, this uh, Boltzmann distribution and uh, such that this uh, aim probability distribution is asymptotically obtained. Uh, and the property of the Markov chains is such that making some rather general assumptions uh, which we are not going to discuss in more detail today, let's just uh, that uh, one can uh, so if these general assumptions are fulfilled then uh, one can guarantee that the Markov chain converges exponentially to the uh, initial aimed uh, probability distribution which is in our case the Boltzmann weight written on the right hand side. So this co convergence from of the Markov chain to the aimed probability distribution is characterized by a number of steps needed in order to uh, produce an uh, independent configuration and um, there are two buzzwords that I'm going to just introduce here and then again discuss in more detail uh, towards the end of the last lecture. So the first one would be TO, which we're going to de define in a moment, uh, which goes under the name integrated autocorrelation time. And tau exp, which as the name says, would be exponential autocorrelation time. So why am I mentioning these autocorrelations here? So basically, these configurations that we are going to generate with the uh, algorithms that we are going to uh, present today, uh, it's already important to note now that the configurations that are going to genera be generated with these Markov processes, so the algorithms for Markov processes, are correlated by construction. So F1, F2, Fn config. So in the ideal case, uh, if they would be completely uncorrelated, then our error would really be proportional to uh, 1 over square root of the number of configurations. However, since they are going to be correlated, since our algorithms for generating field configurations are not perfect algorithms, As a result of this, the variance of uh, our estimator for the observable, so the variance of our estimator for the observable or O will be equal to the actual variance of the original observable. And then um, enhanced by two tau o divided by number of configurations, where this tau o is this first quantity that we mentioned here, the integrated autocorrelation time. And uh, the index o tells us that this integrated autocorrelation time depends on the observable uh, we are considering. And one has to study it separately for each observable in order to get 
uh, a reliable estimate estimator of the error obtained in Monte Carlo simulations. So the variance of the actual observable is something that you already know from statistical physics. So this would be just the observable minus an average of the observable uh, O and then squared and the average of that. So uh, the variance of our original observable should not depend on the Markov chain used to generate uh, so used to generate the configurations and on which the observable is estimated. So it should not depend on the Markov chain, so the ensemble generated on uh, generated by using the Markov process because uh, so this the variance of the actual observable is a property of uh, quantum field theory that we are studying. However, our measured variance is always going to depend on the, uh, on the algorithm which we used in order to generate uh, our field configurations. And that's why one has to be very careful when estimated this factor which gives us <coughs> the <laughs> difference between the actual variance and the variance of our estimator. And we will see towards the end of the lecture how a choice, a proper choice of the simulation algorithm can significantly reduce this Enhancement, enhancement factor between the variance of the actual observable and the variance of the estimator. And now we're going to present uh, the most popular and currently only known algorithm that can simulate QCD effectively. And this algorithm goes, so this is the algorithm for the generation of uh, Markov chain of these field configurations. And this algorithm goes under the name hybrid Monte Carlo. With a capital M and C. Uh, so since we haven't discussed the discretization of uh, quantum thermodynamics yet, so even though this algorithm is actively, is actively used in the current research in lattice QCD, since we haven't discussed the discretization of the QCD action yet, this is planned for tomorrow, we will explain this algorithm on this simpler example of scalar field theories. So when this algorithm is originally introduced in order to be able to uh, simulate uh, lattice QCD and uh, this is the original reference Duan Kennedy Pendleton the name of the paper is uh, the name of the today's lecture so hybrid Monte Carlo published in Physics Letters B. Notice the year, 1980, 
seven, and it's still the best algorithm that we have for uh, lattice QCD. So um, in order to demonstrate the basic steps of this algorithm on the example of scalar field theory, we will rewrite this Euclidean action for the scalar field theory in, in a slightly different way. So we will uh, first discretize lattice derivatives and slightly reparameterize these uh, uh, lattice parameters such that uh, the action which we obtain, so we will just denote it as S of phi so far, since we are from now on working in Euclidean only. And it turns out that the original Euclidean action on the right hand side after the discretization and this reparameterization can be written as sum over the all lattice points minus two times kappa. This is the first parameter that we are going to introduce instead of m0 and g0, multiplying sum over all directions. Um, yeah, we'll have the sum from 1 to d, fx, fx plus mu hat. We said that mu hat is a unit vector in mu direction in our lattice discretization plus fx squared plus a lambda times fx squared minus 1 squared. Okay. So what we've done is we've slightly reparameterized our field fx. So we've rescaled it in the following way. You can check that by doing that uh, on the right hand side, we actually obtain this version of the scalar field action convenient for numerical computations. So we rescale the field f uh, phi x, then Instead of m0 squared, we have introduced 1 minus 2 lambda divided by kappa minus 2 times d. So we're still working in an arbitrary dimension. When you start implementing this, if you go home and want to try out what we've done, what we've learned in these lectures and try to implement. Um, and the uh, try to implement uh, the algorithm to simulate scalar field theories. Make sure to choose the right dimension here, depending on the theory you're interested in. And G0 becomes 6 times lambda divided by kappa. So if we perform this change of parameters and uh, drop some constant terms, which are irrelevant in this case, which is just a, a constant factor in the path integral, then absorbed by the partition function, and then um, we obtain this form. So our free parameters, instead of m0 and g0 previously, are now kappa and lambda. So this kappa in particular, has a name, it's called, it is called hopping parameter. And the analogy comes from solid state physics where this hopping parameter um, tells us what is the probability for a quanta to move from one uh, side of a crystal to another. So that's why uh, this name is borrowed also in lattice simulations. And uh, since we are now focusing on numerical methods uh, in this lecture, we will from now on not be concerned with uh, 
what exactly is our minimal distance uh, between the two lattice sites, and we will just set the lattice spacing to be equal to 1. Uh, so before moving on, if, if you want to implement, again, the algorithm that we are going to discuss today, uh, the simplest way to define the lattice geometry <coughs> in such that you actually assume that our fields have uh, periodic boundary conditions. So since we are working on a finite lattice, you know that the nearest neighbor, say that this is our mu direction, the nearest neighbor in the mu direction of this point here is the next one in the mu direction, the nearest, nearest neighbor of this point here is this one, the nearest point of this one is here, and then periodic boundary condition tells us that our nearest neighbor in the mu direction, you would hop around the lattice and would be uh, our first point in the lattice. So formally, if you want to write this down, so fx plus l, where l is the length of the lattice, times uh, in mu direction, times the unit vector in mu direction, will be equal to fx. So this is only one choice of boundary conditions which we can have on the lattice in principle. One can also have anti-periodic boundary conditions with a minus sign here and so on. Uh, some fixed boundary conditions, open boundaries and so on. But for these simulations of scalar field theories, periodic boundary conditions are sufficient. And before moving on, I forgot to give you some references where if you're interested in practical implementation of, uh, of what the algorithm that we are going to discuss today, you can find an extended version of uh, the approach that, that I'm following in today's lecture, very well written in Stefan Schaeffer's uh, Lesouche Lectures Write-Up. So this is a practical tutorial which will also give you some code snippets and if you go on the web page um, for that tutorial you can also download some uh, basic implementation of, uh, of uh, scalar field theory on the lattice and try to implement some additions which are discussed in the tutorial and part of it will be discussed in today lec today's lectures but we won't be able to cover everything that is in this tutorial. So the name of the lectures, since I haven't written down the archive number, but you can download them from archive, is uh, simulations with the agency algorithm. Algorithm, implementation and data analysis. So Stefan discusses in much more detail the data analysis that we are going to discuss here, as well as particular uh, subtleties of Im implementation of the HMC algorithm, still in the same um, model that we are going to discuss today. So an example of scalar field theories. So I would strongly recommend you 
to uh, have a look at this write-up and try to implement what you will learn today and some more what's discussed in the write-up. Uh, try to actually write down the code to simulate scalar field theories. Uh, another reference where in even more details this uh, integrated autocorrelation time, exponential autocorrelation time is formally defined and some more details on the current simulations in lattice QCD are discussed are actually the lecture notes of your next week's speaker Martin Luscher from the same uh, school in Les Uches in 2009, but the topics discussed there are still very much current. And uh, here I have the archive number, so I'm not going to write down the name of the lectures. These are two basic references for this lecture that I'm giving you today. All right, so um, now going back to our simulations of scalar field theory. So once we have defined this discretized version of the action, then I will remind you that we will compute the expectation, uh, so the path integral, which gives us the expectation value of the observable, becomes 1 over the partition function, and then our integral over the field configurations f becomes the product over the integrals over the individual field configurations in each lattice site multiplied by the Boltzmann weight and our observable evaluated on each field configuration F where the partition function is given by integral over the same product times the Boltzmann weight itself. So in this particular theory, there are some interesting observables that you may try to compute once uh, you implement the algorithm that we are going to discuss towards the end of this lecture. So Similarly, so again, analogy to the statistical mechanics, you can try to compute magnetization, which would be just the sum over the field variable fx evaluated in each lattice point x. However, as we've seen yesterday, since uh, reflection. Positivity is the symmetry of the theory, so if we change field variable fx into minus fx, the action stays invariant. So this means that on average, so if we <coughs> compute the average of this observable defined just as the sum of all field variables due to this symmetry, on average, this magnetization has to be zero. So once you implement the algorithm to simulate scalar field theories, then this is a useful check whether you've generated your field configurations properly. You can evaluate this observable on your set of field configurations and on average, so within the error bars defined by the proper estimate of the variance, uh, your observable has to have an expectation value zero. Now, a non-zero observable, which can be measured in this simple theory 
would be magnetic susceptibility. Uh, which would be average of the magnetization squared divided by uh, lattice volume. And a third example of the commonly studied observable in statistical mechanics but also very useful for studying uh, scalar field theories uh, in the lattice approach is the so-called Binder cumulant. Defined as average of the fourth <laughs> power of the magnetization divided by an average of uh, the square of the magnetization and then squared. So this is obviously dimensionless quantity, so it can be used also as uh, a replacement for the phenomenological coupling. And an interesting fact is that uh, this Quantity has been proposed already in 1981 by one of the professors of uh, Mainz University. Since we are now in Mainz, let's mention this reference. So, Kurt Binder. This was proposed in order to study statistical systems and has been used intensively also in the studies of simulations of lattice models as well, so 1981. So now that we have defined the discretized action mm -hmm. of lattice gauge theories and the observables, we can finally move on to the algorithm to define our set of field configurations. So to define the Markov chain of field configurations Fi, such that we can now estimate each of these observables and some more by just computing the expectation value of O, I will write this again, as an average of number of configurations sum All right, so now I see what you were referring to. There was a bracket in the previous uh, in the previous write-up missing. So, uh, so the order of one over square root of apologies for that. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. I'm not really sure what... Okay, I, I see what, uh, what Andreas is actually trying to say. So, uh, if this is of order 1 and we have the sum of uh, configurations from 1 to number of configurations divided by number of configurations, we will then have uh, the order of one 
anyway. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then so the algorithm which we are uh, going to use in order to define, uh, in order to generate our uh, Monte Carlo, uh, in order to generate our Markov chain, so the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, so the first thing it does is basically uh, it in enlarges the partition function. So our original partition function, which has uh, the integration over the field variables phi x. So we will enlarge the partition function by introducing auxiliary field variables. which we will call pi x. So those will be the conjugate, con conjugate variables to our corresponding to our scalar field phi x. So our enlarged uh, partition function will now be have a product over the phi x. So we will integrate over this newly introduced auxiliary variables by x. We will still have the integral over the original uh, field variables, the phi x. And then our Boltzmann weight will now contain some function of this auxiliary variables pi and our original field variables uh, phi. And uh, so this enlarged uh, partition function will help us move through the configuration space of x in such a way that we are finally able to generate the ensemble of gauge configurations such that uh, our phi x variables satisfy the original Boltzmann distribution. So this is our goal distribution e to the minus Euclidean action of the scalar field theory. So this function h of pi and uh, and f is actually looks very much like the Hamiltonian in uh, classical mechanics therefore the, the is denoted with h so basically this function has uh, the sum over the squares of all field variables by x. This one half uh, factor here is arbitrary. In principle, the same algorithm should work with any factor here. But for convenience and for actual analogy with the kinetic term in uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, we will use one half here plus our original action of the scalar field theory uh, S of phi. So basically, we have introduced these auxiliary variables in the partition function such that our new partition function looks like this. But it's very important to note that once we introduce this Gaussian term in, um, in uh, our partition function, the expectation values of all remain unchanged. 
so they are unaffected by this auxiliary variables pi of x. So again, uh, in the analogy with uh, classical mechanics, we will also, so we will call those uh, fields, uh, well, they're analogous to the generalized coordinates. And then uh, for this reason, these auxiliary fields are also called uh, lattice momenta. So, uh, so the main aim of adding this momentum uh, auxiliary variables is to actually to allow for a particular kind of uh, field update in order to generate uh, a Markov chain of field configurations, Fx. And this update is known as molecular dynamics and used in many other areas of statistical physics. So once we have the Hamiltonian for our system, then we will evolve field uh, configurations following the so-called uh, molecular dynamics evolutions. And this evolution will be governed by the Hamiltonian equations of motion, which are very well known to you from statistical, from uh, classical mechanics. So uh, the derivative of the field variable with respect to some time in which we are evolving this Hamiltonian, this is not an actual time, but some fictitious time in our Monte Carlo chain. Uh, so the derivative of the variable with respect to tau will be equal to the partial derivative of h with respect to pi. And the derivative of the momenta with respect to time the Monte Carlo time, which we are going to introduce in a moment, will be equal to the minus partial derivative. So these are nothing but classical Hamiltonian equations of motion. And we are going to use those in order to evolve our field configuration. So we are going to solve for these classical equations of motion and uh, obtain some field update for our configurations phi. So it's important to note here that these are not actual equations of motion of the underlying quantum field theory. So this is just uh, so these equations of motion are uh, evolving in some fictitious time, t, which is also called uh, Monte Carlo time. And uh, it's introduced for the purpose of generating previously discussed Markov chain and again has nothing to do with the actual time in our time dimension in our quantum field theory. So we will solve these classical equations of motion and this will give us the update for, uh, for our field uh, phi. So this procedure to update the field uh, it's important, so in order to be able to uh, make sure that our distribution is the uh, actual distribution defined by our, the action of the scalar field theory, it's important that our Hamiltonian 
stays conserved while solving these equations of motion. And another important point is coming from, uh, again, our knowledge of classical mechanics and statistical mechanics as well, that uh, phase space volume dp d phi also has to stay conserved. And one has to make sure that whichever algorithm is chosen to generate the field configurations in uh, lattice gauge theories that uh, the, the properties, so these two properties are satisfied and it, we will see that hybrid Monte Carlo actually satisfies uh, these two constraints. So this ensures basically that in our, so if these two conditions are satisfied, this ensures that in our configuration space, let's say that we have uh, a configuration space spanned by our variables pi and uh, f. So this ensures that, uh, so these two constraints actually ensure that the uh, probability of getting from one point in the configuration space by one phi one. So the system actually has equal likelihood. So the algorithm has to be such that the system has the equal likelihood to visit any point in phase space. So so by evolving so the algorithm has to be such that by evolving this classical equations of motions, we are able to uh, uh, to obtain uh, each point in our, in the ideal case, each point in our phase space. So, and then in the analogy with uh, classical mechanics, so this uh, Monte Carlo time along which one moves from one configuration, one point in configuration space, phase space to another point in configuration space space is denoted again with tau and it's also called tri trajectory, which again has nothing to do uh, with an actual trajectory in our quantum field theory, but this is a trajectory in along some Monte Carlo time t. Yes. I don't know how this algorithm works, but do I understand correctly that you sampled the corporation, this pi phi corporation, you ran the sampling in the beginning? This is the next step that I'm going to discuss, but you're right, yes. But then afterwards you just evolve it using this, and you don't do sampling anymore. Uh, at the beginning of each, so I'm just going to discuss now the steps uh, which go into this Mont hybrid Monte Carlo trajectory. All right, so the first, uh, but uh, your first guess is the correct one. So uh, we are going to sample. So we now come to the basic ingredients of the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. And we are going to illustrate a single trajectory update. So what happens from starting from one point in configuration phase space until we get to the next point in configuration phase space. So single uh, hybrid Monte Carlo trajectory. And these are the ingredients. So as already indicated in the back. Uh, so the first step is the so-called momentum heat bath. So we are randomly going to uh, generate our uh, 
HMC, so Hybrid Monte Carlo Momenta. So momentum heat bud. So we will generate the moment of pi such that the probability of phi i will be proportional. So it will be just following the Gaussian distribution. So phi i squared divided by 2. So these momenta are generated. We can discuss if time allows in more details how exactly one does this in the algorithm. But for now, let's stick to the uh, main messages of this algorithm. So it's just important to note that they're generated completely independently from our field configuration, uh, from field configuration phi. So we use random numbers in order to uh, generate this simple Gaussian distribution of the momenta. And then in the next steps, so in the second step, um, the fields phi are evolved according, so both fields phi and field phi are evolved according to this uh, molecular dynamics uh, equations of motion. So the second step is molecular dynamics evolution. So let's write it here again. So the derivative of phi with respect to the Monte Carlo time t will be the derivative of r equal to the derivative of r Hamiltonian with respect to the momenta, where we are taking in each step the current value of the momenta at time t and uh, the current value of the field at time t. Similarly, the momentum fields are also updated in such a way that the second equation of motion, Hamiltonian equation of motion is solved. So it's the derivative of momentum with respect to time equals to the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to field x, of course, with a minus sign. So one numerically solves these uh, equations of motion for some uh, interval of Monte Carlo time tau. So the details of this, of this uh, numerical integration which goes into Monte Carlo evolution, again, we can discuss uh, later or okay. privately. Yes, please. So you need an initial condition no? for phi x? for phi x as well, yes. Uh, but as you will see, so one usually takes uh, the previous field configuration. So we will start from some phi 1, which will be generated according to some distribution. And then, so we starting from some initial fields, uh, some, some initial fields, phi, exactly, we will update them and then in the last step we will decide what will be our initial step for our next Monte Carlo update. So if you just let me finish the, the third step, you will, uh, you will see what will be, because we will repeat these steps one, two, three in each Monte Carlo update. So in the third step, uh, we have the so-called acceptance 
reject step or another name for this is uh, metropolis step because it follows the procedure developed in the metropolis algorithm so basically we will compute the difference in the Hamiltonian evaluated at our current value of the field and of the momentum after the molecular dynamics evolution. So Hamiltonian evaluated at pi 2 and phi 2 minus the Hamiltonian evaluated at our initial field configuration phi 1 and the corresponding momenta which were randomly generated in this first step. And uh, since we are solving for equations of motion corresponding to, to the Hamiltonian, so uh, if we, we would have if we would have been able to solve for this equation of motion exactly, then this difference would be zero. However, due to the errors of our numerical integration of these equations, uh, there is some uh, non-zero, usually, uh, difference between the Hamiltonian at the beginning and at the end of the this molecular dynamics trajectory. And then this metropolis step will decide whether we want to keep our final uh, field configurations or are we going to uh, start over from our initial configuration which we had at the beginning of the HMC trajectory. And uh, so this accept reject rule is the following so we will accept field phi 2 which we've obtained by integrating uh, Hamiltonian equations of motion uh, we'll, uh, we'll accept it with the probability which is equal to the minima of these two numbers so the minimum between 1 and e to the minus delta h. So you can see that if delta h is negative, we are always going to accept. But uh, if delta h is positive, then there are uh, there is a certain algorithm, again, which we can discuss a little bit later, how exactly one practically numerically implements this uh, probability of the acceptance of the new configuration. Okay. And uh, so these are the basic in ingredients of Monte Carlo algorithms. We would start with some field configuration phi 1 in the beginning, then follow these steps, get by solving, so by evolving. Uh, our Hamiltonian in this fictitious Monte Carlo time, we will reach some other configuration phi 2, but uh, since we've just added the Gaussian to our uh, initial Boltzmann uh, probability distribution, so it tells us that, uh, so basically we know that this newly generated configuration phi 2 should be belong to the same probability and probability distribution, both from probability distribution. And um, uh, if in this accept reject step, this usually this violation of the Hamiltonian, if it's too large, this configuration will automatically be rejected. If, uh, and then uh, this acceptance reject step makes us helps us correct for the fact that our integration of molecular dynamics evolution 
uh, when I call the language equations, is not exact. So this basically uh, this last step makes sure that our uh, Hamiltonian remains conserved. So depending on the accept reject step, this configuration is either going to be accepted or not. If it's accepted, then one will start from phi 1, uh, phi 2, and then our initial field configuration here will be the last configuration which has been accepted in the previous step. If one rejects this configuration, then one, one would move back to the initial field configuration phi 1 and go through the steps 1, 2, 3 again in order to until some next configuration is accepted. And all the accepted configurations will, uh, will be elements of our Markov chain. Because again, by adding this momentum term in the Hamiltonian, we haven't altered our original distribution. So the average, so the configurations phi 1, phi 2, phi 4 will be distributed according to our aim distribution e to the minus uh, e to the minus s f where this is our previously defined lattice action and uh, of the scalar field theory and um, if uh, and if the all the configurations are generated according to this distribution, as we've mentioned several times so far, then one can simply evaluate each of the observables at the generated field configuration, sum over all the observables, divide by n configurations, and get an estimator of the average for our uh, Monte Carlo observable. Yes, please. Sorry, why is the acceptance probability asymmetric in the sign of delta H? So instead of taking the absolute value, you have a cutoff or a negative. So why do you immediately accept if it's a negative? Mm, that's a. Uh, yeah, so um, let me try to think of a simple way to explain that. So let's say that, so if you look at the Hamiltonian here, then, um, so this action S uh, acts like a potential in classical mechanics. So basically, uh <coughs> the so So you're moving towards the the minima of of this action. So if you um, at the moment, so uh, <laughs> so uh, let's maybe discuss this uh, afterwards. But uh, but there is actually a rather simple explanation of uh, of, of this one. Yes, uh, please. Does it have anything to do with? Uh, I don't remember the term detailed equilibrium, something like that. Uh, the detailed balance, you mean? Yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Uh, it's like a, well, the probability to go from this state to the other one multiplied by, well, so it's the, this conditional uh, probability uh, equation that you can read. Uh, exactly, write yeah. And yeah, I think there's a way to relate this thing to that uh, the balance. Um, what's your name, sorry, again? Huh? What's your name again? Uh, Ilhon. Okay, so what Ilhon is trying to say, so what we were discussing here is that the probability uh, of being at state uh, phi uh, 1 times the transition probability to go from state phi 1 to state phi 2 has to be the same as the probability of being at state phi 2 times the transition probability to go from state type phi 2 to phi 1. But uh, I'm not able to right now directly relate that to the actual sign of delta H. Let's discuss this after the lecture. All right. So uh, in the remaining couple of minutes, let me just tell you a little bit of history related to uh, how one arrived at this algorithm. So in principle, as we mentioned already earlier, if we would be able to solve the molecular dynamics evolution equations exactly, then one would be, uh, it would be, uh, it would be uh, sufficient to have this step one and step two of the hybrid Monte Carlo. So the acceptance reject step would not be needed. And in this case, uh, so this algorithm was in fact invented in the same year as hybrid Monte Carlo. And uh, this went under the name uh, hybrid molecular dynamics. Hybrid molecular dynamics. So this would be step one plus step two. And uh, if this integration would have been exact, then hybrid molecular dynamics would be able to give us field configurations phi with a proper uh, Boltzmann distribution as well. Uh, but however, since they are solved, so a very, very fine numerical uh, integration is needed here in order to be able to generate the right distribution with only using steps one and two. However, this acceptance reject step allows for uh, performing this intermediate step at much uh, lower numerical costs, so with less finer integration steps in the evolution of these equations. And uh, this last step. So over the course of next lectures, we will discuss in a bit more detail how exactly both this uh, hit path generation, molecular dynamic evolution, and the acceptance reject step is uh, implemented in practice. But uh, let me stop for now and ask if there are some more questions. Yes, please. For the error? No. So, uh, so actually, uh, we are actually looking in the error. So, since this is uh, the Markov chain is in so uh, process in going in one direction. So, despite the fact that we actually, uh, so we have to have the same probability to go from field configuration phi 1 to phi 2 and so on, but uh, uh, but for this last step, yeah, we're looking only in the, so the final field configuration minus the, minus the Hamiltonian at the initial field configuration. And uh, so the fact that the, the action is actually uh, symmetric under the change of phi to minus phi, this guarantees that we are actually moving in uh, in all directions. But 
but this is the the right way to go. Yes. I have a question about the second cons uh, constraint there. Yeah. So, uh, in which state do we uh, do we guarantee that this second constraint, while well the con conservation of the phase space volume, will be conserved? Uh, yeah. So we have to make sure in this. Uh, second step. So this is actually the Liouville theorem from statistical mechanics, but how we implement this, uh, uh, how we actually implement this uh, 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 in practice is basically by choosing the integrator of, uh, of these uh, molecular dynamics equations such that, uh, such that the, this measure in is conserved. So again, I've prepared uh, also to discuss, uh, we didn't get there yet today, but uh, uh, if you're interested, we can start with that tomorrow and then uh, move on to the fermion and gauge fields. So uh, a particular choice of the integrator for these equations has to be such that the phase space is conserved. So <laughs> these integrators go under the name of symplectic, I symplectic integrators, for example, and leapfrog which we will discuss in these lectures, is one of the simplest way to implement this integration such that the phase space is conserved, but there are also more advanced integrators. And whenever one is choosing an integrator to evolve these molecular dynamics equations, one has to make sure that, that the phase space is conserved, among other things, including the detailed balance that you mentioned. Thank you for that. So, I mean, uh, I didn't quite get, so I mean, even if the third step rejects it, you put back in, I mean, the integrator, is it somehow, is there something random to it? Because, I mean, if I use some method and I integrate the same thing again, it will say, get the same delta H, no? It will be the same. So, I mean, I can uh, yeah. run this through, but at some point I need to, so I can run it a hundred times and at some point it will maybe accept it, but it will be the same result, no? So, the phi 2 will be the same. As that's, a, that's a really good point. So, it won't be exactly the same result because you will generate at each this momentum heat vat, so I didn't go in much detail there, but uh, so it's a good point to mention. So this is, uh, so these momenta are generated randomly at the beginning of the trajectory. So you would use a different seed to generate this random momenta. So basically it would just, it would give your system a kick in a different direction. So your first randomly generated momenta would maybe move you in this direction and you will end up in this field configuration. If it is rejected, you will have uh, this momentum hit bad step again, which will generate the momenta which satisfy this Gaussian distribution, but they will be randomly chosen and uh, they will then move you, just to illustrate, in a different direction and give you a different delta H and here. Uh, the second question is that we yeah. also, I mean, I mean, I could just take an integrator which is like really bad, and I would always get a large age, and I will run long enough, I will somehow still get my Markov chain, which is just bad. Yeah, <laughs> but I the mean, probability, uh, but if you would get a really large, uh, if you would really get a really large age, then your e to the minus delta h would be a really small number, as yeah, you can see long here. To, to, to finish, but at some point. Uh, sorry? Oh, like, uh, yeah, you would basically. You make, uh, so my question would be like, when you're done, how do you make sure it's actually a good solution? Why don't you know? Uh, <coughs> maybe my integrator was like complete, not good, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the the delta h is very large always, and it just took an incredible long time, and was incredible small probability, but at some point it might get picked. Right. Uh, how do you make sure? But you would not have. Uh, I mean. As long as the probability is non-zero, it can be picked, no? Even at 10 to the power well, minus 10. But delta h can also be negative in the line, right? It's completely arbitrary, this distribution uh, of delta h, when you choose a very bad integrator. Uh, so, so you would not get okay, okay. the... You can have anything there. So yes, okay. Hardman? In the end, of course, one monitors the acceptance rate. So you, you, you uh, yeah. take the expectation value of the, this number. Um, and so you, you check uh, what is the fraction of the configurations that get accepted. Yeah. So and if you if something like what you just described happens, then of course you would have to adjust the uh, the step size in your integration. 
in order to increase it, in order to somehow diminish the energy violations. Exactly. So, so all right, so practical point that I did not mention here that this acceptance probability has to be kept. You want to keep it relatively close to one. So usually a good choice in order to be to make sure that you've generated your micro chain with a proper distribution is somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. I mean, in principle, you can go all the way to one. I mean, to 100 percent, but. Uh, uh, but then this just means that you're overdoing it and uh, you're spending too much computational power to generate so your you more right? Exactly, okay. yeah. Yes, please. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, the term which, well, defines your, the strength of your quartic coupling. So it is, in a sense, as you can see, related to, to G0, but you can see that the, uh, the change of variables which we had, uh, so that the, the, the G0 is uh, also inversely proportional to kappa, it's not only proportional to lambda. Uh, to lambda. So both of them together um, affect the actual coupling that we have in the system. So the larger the hopping uh, parameter, the smaller the, the coupling. All right. If there are no more questions, then thank you, and we'll continue tomorrow morning.